Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is uh, Maurizio Cecconi. I'm an intensivist based at Humanitas Research Hospital and Humanitas University in Milan, and I'm the president of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to be here today because uh, today is the start of uh, a new collaboration uh, with a leading institution in the world about uh, health economics and economics and leadership in general, like the London School uh, of Economics. Um, the theme of today's webinar is about improving outcomes in ICU. Uh, and this is really what we care about in our units. And this is what we have tried to do with our society uh, for a number of years. You have seen that we have invested more and more into education about quality improvement, benchmarking, leadership, and management. And we are very excited really to start now uh, this new chapter with the London School of Economics. We will also have a joint uh, a postgraduate course in Paris at our annual conference. There are still a few slots available if you rush to get one. And uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce also my co-chair for this webinar today, Professor Alistair Maguire. He's a professor of health economics and the head of the health policy department at the London School of Economics. Alistair, how are you today? Great, thank you, Maurizio. Um, we're also very excited to kickstart this collaboration between the Ut European Society for Intensive Care Medicine and ourselves, the LIC. And I just want to give you a, a couple of quick introductory slides to uh, tell you a little bit about our department and about the LIC. Um, obviously, we're a leading social science school we're not a very big school, certainly by European or American standards, we're not big at all. We only have 12,000 students, about half of whom are undergraduates and half are postgraduates. We're routinely ranked very highly in all these rankings of universities, and we like to think of ourselves in the top three after Oxford and Cambridge, or maybe even in between Oxford and Cambridge in the UK. As a department within the LSE, we're one of 28 teaching departments. We have about 400 students uh, split roughly between traditional one-year MSc programs and uh, a, a bunch of executive MSc programs where students come in over a two-year period. And our student body is uh, very diverse. We have hardly anybody, surprisingly, from the UK, and mainly we have uh, students from the, the rest of the world, about 150 countries at, at the last count. Uh, the LSE has been interested in health and health policy since just after the Second World War. Uh, someone called Brian Abel Smith, who uh, started, who was the research assistant on the first Royal Commission into the National Health Service in the UK, started the interest uh, within uh, the Department of Social Administration, as it was, and since then, we've steadily grown in our interest in terms of health policy, such that in 2017, as you can see from this slide, the department itself was established. And since then, we've, got, we've gone from strength to strength, I think, um, such that hopefully this collaboration with the European Society for Intensive Care Medicine will be another strength added to uh, one of our many interests across the globe. And we do have uh, many interests, as you can see from this slide. We have a number of collaborations stretching across Africa, Europe, the US, um, and increasingly uh, into Asia. So we're truly a global um, institution. That's also reflected in our reach of research. Uh, these are the colored um, uh, countries in this slide are where we have active research this year which is ongoing. Um, and as you can see, that stretches throughout the globe. So uh, we want to continue our outreach to the globe. And I think the European Society is exactly the type of partnership that we want to build off to do so. Um, and of course, we're very interested in health policy. We take the 
the main uh, interest from this uh, self-proclaimed genius uh, who said that health policy was, uh, as part of healthcare, even more complex than taxation. So if you want to go and uh, remind yourself of what he said, it's on the YouTube link at the bottom of your screens here. But uh, it certainly is complex, and I think that hopefully we're providing some so solutions to this complexity. So with that very quick introduction, Maurizio, I'll hand back to yourself as co-chair. Thank you, Alistair, and I hope you're not directing people to watch the YouTube video now, and actually they stay with us also because... <laughs> After they, <laughs> Also because they can participate... Uh, uh, if they are logging to our ESIC TV platform, they can uh, be in the chat and ask questions. We are monitoring these questions and we will try to answer all of them after in the open debate. So great pleasure now to introduce the first speaker of today, uh, Dr. Leni Derde. She is an ICU consultant at the University Medical Center in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, she was trained an infectious disease uh, physician and also an epidemiologist. Her research focus on severe infections and sepsis and the use of innovative trial design is being instrumental, I would say, uh, also during this pandemic. Indeed, she is the global chair of RIMAP-CAP, which is an adaptive platform trial, which brought a lot of important contributions from research to bedside. And then now is also the uh, chair-elect of the ESIC Education and Training Committee. So, hello, Eleni, how are you? Uh, hi, Maurizio, thanks. Uh, I'm great, and, and thank you for that really kind introduction. Um, shall I start the presentation? Yes, I think so. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning into this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about leadership in research during the pandemic, uh, but not before I share with you my potential conflicts of interest, which are mainly around me doing research on uh, pandemic preparedness even before the pandemic. Um, so I wanted to start with this picture. Uh, many of you have seen pictures like this, similar pictures. This to me shows the kind of intricate, intricate relationship between ICU and pandemics because ICU medicine exists because of pandemic. Uh, you may know that uh, in uh, 1953, there was a huge surge of uh, polio uh, across the globe actually, also in Denmark, uh, and at a certain point, the numbers of patients coming into hospitals, uh, they couldn't handle it anymore. They just didn't have enough ventilators. They did have ventilatory support, uh, showing uh, here the iron lungs and in the top of the slide, the, uh, the rocking beds, as they called it, uh, but there just weren't enough uh, for all these patients. So enter Bjorn Ibsen, you may have heard of him, him uh, an anesthesiologist from Denmark, and he was a real leader. And he said, we have to do this differently. We can't ventilate all these patients if we don't have ventilators. I propose we tracheostomize all these patients and we ventilate them with positive pressure using a bag and mask system. And not everybody agreed, but he was allowed to test his procedure on a what everybody thought was a lost case. Um, and that was 12-year-old Vivi Epson. You may not have seen her before, but I think she, she could be considered the first ICU patient ever. I don't have time to do the story fully justice, but uh, I'll suffice to say that uh, she survived the procedure and the hospital admission, although she was admitted for uh, almost two years in that hospital. And this is a picture of her a little bit later on. Um, uh, as you can see, she did end up uh, a paraplegic dependent on care and ventilators for the rest of her life. But she, as the story goes, did uh, lead a full life um, and actually survived several more pandemics before she died from pneumonia at the age of 31 in 1972. So one of the pandemics that she survived was a 1957 uh, Asian flu. That was a very mild disease. It mainly caused empty classrooms, full hospitals. And most of these patients did not need oxygen or ventilation. But what I wanted to show you is a kind of analysis that was done a couple of years after this pandemic. Uh, and then just take that to uh, what you know now about pandemics. In this report from 1961, it was uh, stated, we approach every pandemic as if it is new, and we shouldn't do that. We should learn from previous pandemics. Um, and it lists kind of the key bullet points. Uh, we have to recognize pandemics early. We have to focus on being able to manufacture enough vaccines for all our 
patients uh, and, and for the whole population. There's even talk about uh, equitable vaccine distribution and about information and misinformation and disinformation. And there's a tiny paragraph on research in one sentence on therapeutics in this whole manuscript. Uh, then for a couple of years, nothing much happened. Um, but there's a similar kind of manuscript from 1997. And you have to imagine that between 1961 and 97, uh, there were several pandemics. But yeah, there was just no, not much interest in pandemic preparedness. This manuscript was not that much different from the one in 1961. It focused on early de detection of the pandemic, uh, manufacturing and utilizing vaccines, uh, a little bit about therapy and potential therapies that were coming. And this is around the time that terms like emergency preparedness appear in the literature. And again, a very tiny paragraph on research. And you'd think that after the turn of the century, things would change, right? That we would get more into pandemic preparedness because we've seen so many, uh, but that's actually not the case. If you type in pandemic preparedness on PubMed, this is the number of citations that you get. And the big bulk at the end, obviously, is the COVID-19 pandemic. But this was despite two large pandemics, the SARS outbreak in 2002, 2003, and the 2009 uh, swine flu uh, pandemic. Um, and you may say, well, but you looked for pandemic preparedness uh, uh, research, uh, and maybe there was not a lot that was being written about that, but research was being done. That was actually also a little bit disappointing. Uh, this is a graph from a study published in 2020 uh, that shows you the number of patients enrolled in either prospective cohorts or uh, therapeutic intervention studies uh, in the 2009 swine flu pandemic. And if you look at the third bar here, the very, very small bar, you can see that the data of only 153 patients in total uh, were uh, uh, published uh, at any time. So in this whole pandemic, data of 153 patients ended up in published manuscript. None of those published during that pandemic. So we could have done a little bit better maybe. But there's also good news uh, because there was uh, there were some things happening in the background, and this is actually kind of a nice link to the London School of Economics because I think an important thing that happened in the background that's not so much in research but is in uh, policy documents is the change to the international health regulations in 2005 when the WHO, rather than focusing on a couple of infectious diseases like cholera and plague, said that they would now um, uh, try to uh, um, uh, prevent and control all communicable diseases and then weigh the consequences of that against the uh, kind of um, effects on international travel and trade because international travel and trade uh, changed a lot since the 1990s uh, up to 2005. So I think that's a very important uh, landmark regulation. Um, and I think there are three key things that changed in how we thought about pandemics. First of all, uh, people realize that every crisis is alike. Whether you manage a surge of patients as a hospital because of a nuclear incident, a terrorist attack, or a pandemic, the surge is like 80% the same. So if you then create crisis plans, uh, you can do with more or less one crisis plan with a, a couple of tweaks rather than uh, creating a different strategy for each crisis that you anticipate. A second thing is people realized it may be better to focus on resilience rather than preparedness. What I mean there is you can prepare for a big crisis uh, that may not happen in the next 50 years, but what you can also do is train for smaller crises. Uh, if you take again the hospital as an example, if you try to be resilient and be prepared for the seasonal influenza peak that you have each year, it may be easier for you to adapt when a big crisis, a big influenza pandemic or a coronavirus pandemic occurs. So that's the second change. And the third change is people realize that research needed to be part of pandemic preparedness, and I call that pandemic research preparedness. And this really got accelerated during the uh, West African Ebola outbreak in 2014, um, when people realized the outbreak was not going to get uh, controlled if they didn't do research, and this is how they tested Ebola vaccines. So some things did happen. Um, and then came COVID. So how did we do in research in COVID, and especially related to leadership? 
Uh, I think we did some amazing things. This is a, a picture from a manuscript that was uh, published uh, early 2020 in JAMA, and it just shows you the amazing speed of science at the beginning of this pandemic, where we uh, took about seven days to identify a completely new virus, and even compared to the SARS outbreak uh, 2002, it was much, much faster. Uh, so this is really an achievement of science. Also, if you look at intervention trials, there was much more activity than the graph I just showed you for the swine flu uh, pandemic. This is the WHO trials tracker uh, from earlier this year. It shows you about 4,000 clinical trials uh, uh, being uh, executed across the globe. And at that point, almost half of those uh, were still recruiting patients. So that feels like a little bit more good news, but there are also some downsides to this. First of all, if you look at the number of publications, you can see that uh, kind of the top two diseases that we publish about in the medical literature, breast cancer and HIV, uh, they have, let's say, around 10,000 publications per year. And that uh, number has steadily increased a little bit between 2010 on the left and 2020 in the middle. But what you can see is that those numbers are dwarfed by the over 50,000 COVID-19 publications in 2020 and the over 78,000 uh, uh, in uh, 2021. Um, and this has disadvantages because you can't even see it anymore in this graph because the, the blue and the purple are dwarfed by the red bar. Uh, but the number of publications on breast cancer and HIV has actually decreased over the last years as a result of researchers diverting their attention elsewhere. So that may be a disadvantage of what we've done. And we may, we may want to reconsider that. Uh, and the other thing is uh, numbers are not everything. You need to provide quality research. So FDA researchers uh, uh, in April 2021 assessed all the uh, uh, clinical trials active at that time and assessed all the arms of all those trials. And what they found is that only about 5% uh, of the trial arms were randomized and adequately powered, and only about a quarter of patients could thus contribute to uh, the creation of evidence-based care. Uh, so that's lots and lots of research waste, and that's really a pity. I'll skip over this, this in the interest of time to summarize that even though you know we've been very active in research in the COVID pandemic, some of it's been kind of old, disconnected, not really synchronized, and maybe we should do better. But how do we get from this to this kind of harmonized, future-proof way of doing research? Uh, that's a complicated question, and uh, that's why I'm also very enthusiastic about the collaboration uh, that we've just initi initiated with the London School of uh, Economics. There's a couple of things I wanted to highlight. The first thing, I think the responsibility for researchers as, le as uh, leaders is to collaborate, not just by uh, collaborating in bigger trial initiatives, but also looking outside your silo of uh, being a trialist or doing observational studies or, or doing basic research. We really have to work together. And in Europe, I wanted to highlight this initiative. Uh, there's ECRA, the European Clinical Research Alliance on Infectious Diseases, that is trying to do that to to create a system where researchers talk to each other and look outside their silo, for instance, combining stats and epi research with lab research and clinical uh, research. But I think we have to look even further outside our, our silos and even look beyond human health because pandemics are not something that just happens. Um, they are increasingly uh, bugging us, I'd say, uh, because of climate change, because of globalization. And we really have to work with people from animal health and uh, wildlife and ecosystems research uh, to, to, uh, to make progress in, uh, for instance, tackling antimicrobial resistance and uh, tackling pandemics. But it's not just researchers that need to be leaders, also funders, regulators, policymakers, and knowledge institutions. Um, and this is a, a very high level slide, and we don't have time to go into the details that are really interesting. But obviously, we need kind of harmonization of funding. We need to, to set priorities in pandemics, and we need to think outside the silo of our own country, which means that funders have to have strategies where they not only make funds available quickly in case of pandemic, but also have structural investments in research in this field. Uh, regulators may have to adapt to uh, simplify executing these trials in these challenging circumstances. 
Um, and I'll skip this in the interest of time. I just wanted to highlight a couple of initiatives that, that are already there. Globidar is a coalition of research funders. Uh, they've been there since before the pandemic, and they're one of the parties trying to get people together, look outside their silo, and make funders work together to support uh, research projects. Uh, the European Commission has uh, uh, started the European uh, Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, that's also um, uh, uh, contributing to uh, activating emergency measures for, measures for uh, conducting research. Um, and then there's the uh, ACT EU initiative from the European Commission, EMA, and uh, HMA trying to facilitate an environment where clinical trials can be conducted more easily. So to summarize, I think collaboration, because it's the right thing to do, and leadership, however complicated that is and multifaceted, uh, as Alistair already said, this is quite complex, I think are the key words for advancing research in pandemics. Thanks for your attention. Lenny, thank you for a fantastic presentation as uh, always, and I'm sure that this will trigger a lot of questions and, uh, and debate uh, uh, later on. So Alistair, uh, up to you for uh, the next uh, speaker. Yeah, thanks Lenny, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, if anything, the pandemic's taught us that collaboration is better than competition. Um, I want now to introduce a couple of my colleagues, uh, Professor Andrew Street, who's the deputy head of my department, who has interests, very broad interests, but I suppose they're encompassed by an interest in healthcare performance. And I also want to introduce our next speaker, who's Dr. Ritesh Maharaj, who is uh, both an intensivist, uh, actually working in intensive care in King's College, uh, London, the hospital there in intensive care medicine, but he's also a fellow within the Department of Health Policy at the LSE. He, he first came to the LSE as part of our executive MSc program in health economics, policy and management, and then he started a PhD and he's now a fellow within the department. And his uh, research really focuses on using um, data, real world data, uh, largely through the hospital episode statistics and the uh, uh, data registry within intensive care in the UK to look at a number of topics, including what he's going to talk about today, which is the association between volume and outcome with regards to sepsis. So hopefully uh, you'll listen to the talk and have questions for him afterwards. Over to you, Ritesh. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today on this webinar. And thank you for the ESM for the opportunity to talk about our paper that we published last year in uh, on the volume outcome relationship for sepsis in the intensive care. This is the, 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 the reference, and it has more details about the methods and uh, the results. But I'll get to the actual uh, brief discussion of the structure of the talk. In essence, the, the key message that I want to get to is that when patients have a lower mortality, when they get cared for in ICU that operate at a, at a sepsis volume of about over 215 patients. And the structure of the talk is going to be firstly on what is the policy issue, what, uh, why might there be a volume outcome relationship, and then a very brief discussion of the data, methods, and the results. And so let's get to what the policy trade-offs are. So every, every year we spend more on critical care and we have more demands on critical care. We have tightening of budgets and scarcity of resources. And so we are faced with questions about how to best organize critical care services to achieve better quality at lower cost. Now, other services like trauma and uh, stroke, uh, cardiovascular services, neonatal services have embraced the idea of concentrating services into a small number of very large uh, uh, hospitals. And it's worth thinking about whether we could do the same for, for critical care, and in this case, for sepsis. So what are the benefits of having a large ICU? Well, we could lower mortality. We could lower costs because we get benefits from economies of scale, where the fixed costs of looking after patients are essentially distributed over a larger number of patients. And then we could get more efficient use of staff and resources because intensivists, this expensive equipment that we use 
is not widely available across all ICUs, and we might get the best value for money if you could have a smaller number of ICUs. Of course, it's possible that these efficiency and clinical gains could come at some unintended cost. And one could be that we could increase the, the fragmentation of care. So we could basically, if we upscale some ICUs, we're going to have to downscale or, or close a bunch of other ICUs. And there may be other services that are dependent on the, those, the, on the ICU that might have to change. It might mean that patients get transported between hospitals to receive one complete episode of care. And there's likely that, that there's going to be some degree of, of, um, of harm from fragmenting care. The second thing is that families would have to travel and patients would have to travel longer distances to, achieve, to access care. This would impose some financial burdens and, of course, some emotional distress from having family members far away. And this could be uh, a barrier to, to access to critical care. Uh, traveling, um, transporting patients between ICUs, if you want to concentrate services in a small number of ICUs, would mean basically an inter-hospital transport system at scale. And while we mostly can do that very well, uh, safely, it's possible that this might introduce some hazard uh, to patients. And lastly, it's possible that ICUs can become overwhelmed. Large ICUs would need to increase their census, would increase their occupancy, and most large ICUs operate at fairly high capacity anyway. So it's not inconceivable that uh, a small increases in volume might result in and might exceed the ICU's capacity to provide care. This is sort of called um, a declining marginal productivity where you increase the, the volume so much that you start getting uh, sort of harm uh, to patients. So why, why, why might there be a volume outcome relationship? Well, it's possible that being large results in better outcomes. So this can be because when you're very large, you have a certain uh, degree of certain amount of resources that result in volume resulting in better outcomes. Or it could be that through activity, through, through experience or through doing things repeatedly, you develop skills that mean that you get better outcomes from volume. It's also possible that patients choose to go to better hospitals. And so it's possible that being very good attracts uh, volume. So in other words, the relationship is that better hospitals have better volume. Now, this latter relationship between outcome resulting in better volume is less relevant for critical care and it's less relevant for sepsis where patients don't actually choose their hospitals. So now that we understand the policy relevance and some of the mechanisms by which volume can get you better outcome, I want you to speak specifically about our, our paper. So very quickly, uh, we, we studied 231 ICUs across England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. We had over 273,000 patients that met the sort of sepsis three criteria. Uh, the mean age was 66, uh, mainly white, mainly 50% uh, male, Half of the patients were mechanically ventilated. 20% of the patients had septic shock. The median length of stay was two weeks. And we had about more than 31% of almost 32% mortality. So this looks like pretty much your average uh, uh, sepsis cohort when you compare sort of registries or administrative database studies across uh, that have been published. And what what we what we found was that the, the, the distribution of eye size of ICU it ranged from as little as 12 patients a year to as much as 744 patients a year. So quite a diverse range of ICUs. And in I mean, when we first started it, we looked at a, a logistic model and we wanted to know did the patients die. We used a bunch of explanatory variables. Mainly we used volume as a as a quartile. Uh, with patient characteristics and ICU characteristics. So when we think about quartiles, it has a, a bit of appeal because it's easy to interpret. You know, we, we put patients into buckets, mild, moderate, and severe. So this kind of makes sense, makes it easy to understand. And also, it's probably the most common way volume has been described in most of the literature. And the analysis yielded the following. We found that when patients looked are looked after in smaller ICUs, they had a much higher mortality than when looked after in larger ICUs. So this is informative. It gives us an idea of what's going on. But of course, quartiles are problematic because 
uh, essentially the uh, the the definition or the or the the sizes of the of the patients that are going into the quartiles is defined by the the, the the data set, and so it isn't very generalizable to another data set. So, um, for example, you might find that uh, the patients that are considered uh, to be on a, a low quartile in one data set are actually in a higher in the highest quartile in another data set. So it it doesn't lend itself to to generalization. And the second thing is that when you use quartiles, all the, the patients within a particular quartile are considered to be homogenous. So, for example, in, um, in this study, the lowest quartile had ICUs which that took between 12 and 177 patients a year. And this analysis then assumes that all those ICUs are the same, which is obviously problematic. And so we then looked at the, we then fitted volume as a continuous variable and looked at it um, there are various ways you can fit continuous variables, and the details of what we did you can find in the manuscript. But the bottom line is that we 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 settled on using restricted cubic splines, and so it's basically the same model, but in this case, volume is fitted out of the restricted cubic spline. And the important information that this model provides is it provides a, a more general understanding of the relationship with uh, of volume and outcome. And you find that mortality decreases with volume but this relationship is non-linear. And so another benefit of using restricted cubic splines is that it allows us to identify the sort of threshold value at which mortality becomes important. And for that, we use something called a marginal model, and it estimates the rate of change in mortality as volume changes. So this is the marginal model. And as you can see, the rate of change where the coefficients become statistically significant is roughly around 215 patients. So that's uh, that's the main sort of takeaway from our study. We assumed that we we, or we we thought it'd be worth exploring whether sicker patients got more benefit, and we found no interaction with severity of illness. So whether you mechanically ventilated, had a high risk of death, uh, had required renal replacement therapy within 24 hours of admission, had septic shock, or had medical causes of sepsis versus surgical sepsis, there was no incremental benefit from volume. So in summary, the, we show that uh, patients with sepsis have a higher chance of survival if treated in large ICUs. This result is not dependent on the severity of the sepsis episode. And interestingly, about 39% of the patients with sepsis in, in this study were cared for in ICUs that were below this volume threshold. So some of our final thoughts, well, we found a mortality benefit, but is the mortality worth the trade-off? So we talked initially about fragmentation of care, and you would think that when um, you know with the development of information systems that we'd be able to manage fragmentation of care better. There isn't much empirical literature in the critical care setting, but when we look at things like trauma networks, we find that um, uh, fragmentation of care is still a pervasive problem. So, uh, so it might be the case that that still holds for critical care. Is it possible that patients prefer local care to better care? Well, when 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 stakeholders are interviewed, many patients felt that um, that the economic or the financial burdens of being of traveling to further to hospitals and uh, emotional distress of having relatives far away would, would would be a barrier to engage with with this process. And uh, a lot of families felt that they had reluctance in, in in going to unfamiliar hospitals dealing with unfamiliar clinicians. So it's a it is a, a bigger issue that, that we might appreciate. Uh, does centralization of care or regionalization of care lead to more inequity? Uh, again, not not very well studied in critical care. Certainly, there is a problem in urban versus rural patients. For certain rural patients, would have to travel significantly longer distances to access care if you undertook these policies. And this is certainly worth considering as a barrier to access. There are studies of how regionalization uh, in, in impacts uh, other uh, specialties that underwent um, regionalization, such as uh, neonatal care, but there's no specific literature in, in critical care. Is there an upper limit to volume? So we weren't able to identify sort of the, the point at which uh, ICUs become uh, overwhelmed. But, and the literature on this is pretty mixed. There are studies which show no no sort of upper limit like ours, but but it's likely given the literature from the COVID pandemic that there is going to be an upper limit to how we can expand ICUs. 
So uh, that's a, a very brief description of our of our, of our paper. And uh, uh, thank you all for your attention and happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, thank you very much, Ritesh. Um, I don't know if, Andrew, do you want to say anything about your uh, part in the study or anything in a wider sense just now, just before we open it up to debate? Um, not really, other than just to say uh, Ritesh has been building on this work to explore a couple of the mechanisms, uh, such as you know why we get these effects, and also to think about whether um, organising uh, ICUs as general ICUs or specialist ICUs is a good idea. So those are the other two areas in which he's been uh, uh, putting his uh, research efforts recently. Okay, thanks. I'll hand it back to Maurizio for the debate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you to Lenny and uh, Ritesh for wonderful talks and, and welcome also to, to Andrew. Um, uh, I have a question maybe to start uh, also with Oh, I think uh, you've frozen, Maurizio. Is he frozen for everyone? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think he has. I think uh, I, I have a question myself, I suppose. Okay. Uh, is it, uh, Maurizio, are you back? Yeah, you're back. You froze just Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, I think I may have a, a bit of an unstable connection if he carries on again while I change. Uh, Alistair, I think you can carry on with the first question. Uh, I'll rephrase it again. Um, uh, Lenny, uh, do you have any data, for instance, on remap cap uh, and the success that you've seen with this adaptive trial platform uh, on how we can actually estimate the value uh, that uh, any euro that we spent in research during the pandemic has brought uh, uh, to our societies? Is there anyone that is looking at that now? And, uh, and if so, can you tell us a little bit more about it? That's an interesting question, Mauricio. Obviously, it's very, very difficult, and there's no easy answer. Uh, there are a couple of initiatives ongoing. Uh, so first of all, um, one of the things we're doing now is looking at longer-term outcomes, because short-term mortality or organ support-free days is one thing, but you want to know if you've had a sustainable impact on patient care. Um, and a second thing that uh, multiple groups are doing is cost-effectiveness analysis of, for instance, platform trials. And then obviously every platform trial is organized differently, but um, the, the, the multi, uh, sorry, the, the multiple domains that you're doing at the same time uh, should bring like cost effectiveness uh, increase. Uh, and the question is if, if that's true. So those are things that are currently being evaluated. There's not a lot of literature uh, yet. I, I also I, had a I question. Think, think this, uh, oh, sorry. I, I also had a question for you, Lenny, on uh, what I thought was a great presentation of the overview of how critical care has um, dealt with pandemics as well as how we move forward. And in moving forward, you you did suggest that we have to be better, uh, more resilient in our healthcare systems, and I think that is uh, one of the core questions of how to build this resistance, this resilience. Um, I, I suppose we've always got trade-offs, especially in Europe, where most of healthcare is publicly financed, between the finance people saying, OK, just get the hospital level to a certain stage, and the clinicians, including yourself, saying, well, we need spare capacity to deal with um, any pandemics or any emergencies. And I suppose uh, I, I'd like to know your views on where you consider that, that sort of question of optimal capacity lies and how we might go about defining optimal capacity to hold for pandemics or resilience uh, in a notion of resilience. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to pretend I'm the expert on that, but I, but I can share a couple of uh, thoughts. Uh, so I think... Uh, obviously, we're working in times of scarcity, and I think that's not going to change, right? We're, we're, we're pressed for personnel, we're pressed for resources, that's not going to change. So we can say, you know, we want more capacity, but that's going to be really difficult. Uh, but the other side of the story is, so if you have 
planable healthcare, like hip replacement or eye surgery or something like that, I think that's a that's that's where a mechanism of reimbursement per patient or something that works. But for acute care, it's a little bit different. And so I don't know the answer uh, to, to this question, but I do think that maybe there, the fact that you kind of, you have a service kind of, you know, running at the basic level, there should be a way to fund that even if there's a period where you're doing less. And so what I was trying to explain in my presentation is you can like do drills for an, a, a terrorist attack for 10 years and never see one, but you will have a, 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 a little surge of patients each winter where you struggle to uh, provide ICU care to patients with seasonal influenza, just regular flu. Uh, and if you're resilient enough to kind of get through those yearly surges, then you'll likely be better prepared for when the big acute surge comes. Um, so that is something that I think now should have priority. Uh, to... Yeah, I agree with you that the planning issue is vitally important. It doesn't make sense to have five-year fiscal plans, for example, and it takes seven to eight years to train a doctor. You know, that just is all out of sync. So it does seem to me that the planning has to be better coordinated as well. Maurizio, do you have anything on this, this topic? No, I, I, I would say it's, it's a very important question. It's a very important topic uh, also at EU level. Uh, recently, we've been uh, talking also with the European institutions about this uh, because, you know, uh, it, it's not just about buying extra beds and ventilators, but, you know, the, the bottleneck is going to be uh, enough workforce and skilled workforce. Now, unlikely that we're going to solve that problem uh, in a few months, uh, but this is something where we need to have a long-term solution. And I think we also have to uh, speak with institutions and, uh, and policymakers about rewarding this extra capacity. Unfortunately, the majority of our healthcare system, they see extra capacity as a waste, and uh, it is not. And as you know, there is a literature also showing that you can be even more productive from an healthcare perspective by having some, some extra capacity. But maybe we really need to, to push this concept forward and have some metrics to see uh, that actually having this extra capacity is something that should be funded and used for emergency. You know, it, the analogy is with the energy crisis during these times, you need to have some of uh, energy production that you keep idle in case of problems. And I think we, we have to start to think about this. We are not going to sort it out only with the goodwill of healthcare workers. We need the policymakers and funding system to follow this. Yeah, I think Lenny touched on that as well when she was broadening out her talk to say that, you know, there's all sorts of uncertainties in the world and how we cope with these uncertainties is, as you say, Maurizio, to try to ensure ourselves against uh, being faced with the uncertainty in the future, whether it's building extra capacity or convincing policymakers that there will be a cost if we don't do something to prepare ourselves for these um, these surges. Um, I, wa I wonder if we should uh, turn to Ritesh as well. It's slightly unfair because I know I'm a co-author on this paper, but um, you did mention uh, the idea of centralization, and I know that that's happened in other areas, for example, in stroke and uh, the specialization leads to some centralization and you get to some sort of inequality of the spread of these resources. And I just wondered if there's, you know, in some ways the US are, are ahead of the UK in, in this. They have more specialized centers for different types of medicine, but it has led to what they call these hospital deserts as well. And I just wonder if there you know, where the trade-off lies between specialization versus ease of access for specialized care. Yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult question um, to get to because uh, there are two aspects. The one is um, sort of uh, creating regional networks for patients who have a particular type of illness where they are high risk of death, they need time critical care 24-7, um, and so the, the common example are trauma, as you say, stroke, uh, cardiovascular care, and neonatal care. 
Um, and overall, they have managed to 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 in aggregate improve the overall outcomes for patients, but also create a yeah, uh, some degree of inequity. And it's again a massive trade-off. Uh, it depends on how the the health system is structured um, in terms of the the spatial orientation of the health system. Uh, some countries have larger, you know, ha larger uh, rural areas, and that might be more problematic. So, it's very much a country-specific um, outcome. It depends on uh, the total number of uh, beds, but also the distribution of beds, the growth of the population, and whether this matches the growth of the resources available. So, the U.S. is unique uh, in that sense compared to many other European countries. It would has a lot of beds, but it also has a lot of uh, concentration of beds in urban areas. I think Europe has slightly fewer beds, but also a bigger dispersion of beds. So it's very difficult to compare the two. Okay, great. We have some questions coming from uh, the chat. Uh, maybe I will ask Andrew to see if he can uh, answer some of these questions. Uh, one is uh, practically how can we uh, assess the value of ICU technology, and I would elaborate actually uh, more broadly, how can we assess the value of ICUs and which perspective should we keep? A hospital, society perspective, and really how can we how can we do it and which data do we need to do that? Because I think this is uh, uh, something that is largely awaited now, certainly at European level from uh, from our experience. I think, I mean, one of the things that we've shown with this, uh, the study that Ritesh um, has presented is the great value of using administrative data and particularly the registry data that, um, that are collected in many uh, countries around the world. And actually for research purposes, they're quite underutilized um, and you, we can make much more of them. And in terms of working out what the value, value of what we do, I mean, one of the one of the critical values that people get from being in ITU is whether or not they survive. So having a measure of outcome um, is really important to, um, to assess value. You need to figure out what the value of services are and measuring that in some way is critical. Um, so a mortality measure is a, as an important measure. Of course, it's not the only one. And there might be other things. There are, of course, many other things that we value healthcare for. So fortunately, not everybody who um, uses health services generally uh, risks dying. But, um, and, and, it, and if that isn't one of a valid, valuable outcome to, uh, a valid outcome for them, we need to think more generally about how we value health services in terms of the other dimensions of, of health outcome that people experience. And around the world, we're not very good at collecting data on the general health outcomes that people experience. Um, and I think we need to get better at that. So the bottom line for value is, for patients at least, we need to get more information on health outcomes. And I think that's one of the really big challenges uh, that we face as societies and we need to address going forward. Thank you, Andrew, very clear. And I think that could be one of the topics where probably we will discuss together to see whether we can get some of this data. I, I can tell you it's very, very important to get uh, at individual countries and certainly at European level now to uh, to inform policy and, and also to try to really to put the right investments into uh, our specialty. Um, I think, Lenny, you have a question maybe for uh, Ritesh, is that right? Uh, yes, thank you, Mauricio. I, I actually wanted to follow up on uh, uh, some of what Andrew just said. Uh, because you elegantly showed that uh, uh, what the effect was on mortality uh, for your sepsis patients. Uh, but did you also look or do you know of other studies that looked at other outcomes? Uh, because even though uh, you know many seps or too many pe sepsis patients die in the ICU, there are other outcomes that are important. And I could imagine that maybe mortality doesn't differ, but quality of life or, or physical performance differs a lot between these hospitals. I, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. Um, so I, I could probably just follow up with that to say that, I, unfortunately, as Andrew said, that we, we're not very good at uh, collecting outcomes beyond mortality, certainly not beyond the hospital stay. And so uh, as much as we'd like to, we don't really know what happens a few months after 
hospital discharge. So that's kind of the limitations of the data sets that we have at the moment. So it's a, certainly a very good question, but we aren't able to answer that. I, I have a question and uh, I, it's something that I have to say, I, I've been thinking and we have been thinking uh, considering what happened over the last three years, but we've not seen much from this. And I was wondering whether you have any uh, insights. Uh, we have seen that one of the biggest problems that we have now was not just the missing workforce before, but some of the burnout and, and disengagement in the healthcare workforce. Um, is there any data that uh, you have in, uh, in terms of that we should collect to understand how making a work environment that is actually is better for our workforce and more attractive would actually bring more value long term? Because this is something that we all agree, but the reality, if you look at policies at local level, uh, they are not really translated into practice. Uh, you know, we are missing staff and we're just asking the same staff to work harder. Uh, not to work in a different way. And, and I suspect maybe in some other areas of work, there are uh, more advanced data on this. I certainly think we need to do something uh, to measure this and also to act, uh, uh, to be able to retain it, to attract uh, uh, healthcare workers to intensive care units. I don't know if Alistair or Andrew, you, you want to comment? Maybe I can start. Uh, there's certainly a lot of work in economics, the, uh, generally about uh, responsiveness of labor supply to wage rates, for example. And we know that within healthcare, um, there's some responsiveness to changes in wage, but in fact, the healthcare labor supply seems to respond, as you've implied in your question, much more to the conditions of work. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of studies and analysis trying to tease out specifically what matters in terms of these conditions. And it's, it's kind of obvious things. Shift work, uh, a growing female participation within the workforce where they have both domestic as well as work duties and shift work doesn't help that. The actual conditions over having control over um, some of their vacations, for example, or control over rotas. And we've seen, for example, within Norway in the last five years, there was a, a strike of junior doctors because the, the planners took away the rotor control from the junior doctors themselves, which does two things. Obviously, it puts another of, layer of bureaucracy into the, into the planning of rotors, but it also takes away control from the staff uh, in terms of planning out their own lives. So I think I think studies are beginning to evolve in that way um, to try to tease out what's important. But of course, the other the other aspect of, of the research is um, about intrinsic motivation. A lot of medics go into the profession in, initially because they think they want to do good, have a duty to their patients, which hopefully is lasting. And that intrinsic motivation is uh, being looked at to see if all these conditions and the changes in working conditions are crowding out that intrinsic motivation as well. So, so it's a work-life balance, which I think is increasingly being looked at. Um, that, as well as uh, the fact that whilst we don't have particularly good data on quality of life for intensive care patients, for example, we have terrible data on the staff. You know, we don't really. We know there's high turnover in uh, most countries, but we don't know where the staffing ends up. We don't follow on a longitudinal basis where staff fall, go through, end up in uh, from moving from one hospital to another or even out of the workplace. And we don't know what motivates these uh, changes. Now, I think the professional associations can probably do more with that. They have uh, data on that as well, but. We're lagging behind the anonymous collect collection of staffing data way behind where we've got to with the data collection on patients at least. So I think we do need to invest more in that in that area. I don't know if Andrew wants to add anything more. Uh, that was a very full answer, but I do just want to, there was just one other question in the chat that I wanted to um, come back to, which was around the the generalizability of the study on ICU size. Um, and um, 
I mean, of course, generalizability is always a challenge because every study that we do or any piece of research that we undertake, whether it's an experiment or a clinical trial or data you, that is, uh, of, um, has been collected for administrative purposes, is always going to be specific to, to time and place. And as researchers, we have to think how generalizable all of our work is. And I think the key thing, the key message from the study that uh, Ritesh described was we just tried to go a bit further in making it generalizable from standard studies looking at the volume outcome relationship, which um, segment volume into quartiles. And the problem with that is uh, it's hard to know what the quartile is. Um, because the quartile in one data set might be quite different for the distribution of, of, of size that you have in another context. Um, so what we tried to do was to maximize the generalizability of, of the volume measurement by using this continuous measure. And that allows us then to take a more uh, general approach and give you a number um, that says on this on this volume scale, um, this is the point where you should be thinking, don't go below that in terms of uh, in terms of your volume size. And that's a that's a bit of a clearer message, I think, than um, just saying don't be in the lowest quartile. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I just want to, to elaborate on one point uh, that Alistair was saying, we don't have very good data on quality of life for ICU survivors. And it is true, even though we're getting more and more. And, and also probably what we don't have enough is a quality of life for relatives or carers of ICU survivors, because the level of dependency that we see uh, on many of the survivors is actually uh, very important. It brings burden also to, uh, to their families. So. Uh, I have a question maybe for Lenny. Do you think we should plan more research also to get uh, some of the outcomes, not just for ICU patients, but for long term uh, for their families and so on? And maybe I would ask the others to elaborate on how can we think about the value of this also in this respect? Uh, thanks, Maurizio. Yes, well, I think obviously, I think uh, as critical care, we've moved beyond just thinking about mortality and uh, I think even more, we have to engage patients in this research because we have to figure out what is important to them uh, and how they weigh things and also what's important to their families. Um, and, and that, I think, is a field that's been developing over the last year, uh, of which I'm not an expert, uh, but we have several in the society. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's key for progressing on that front. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, well, I agree. I think it's important to recognise that Europe's going to have the oldest population globally by about 2035, 2040. And health isn't just about keeping people alive in hospitals. There's all the follow on and social care is certainly in the UK. It's, um, it's dire, the expenditure on social care. And we have to think about ways of both supporting people moving from hospital back into the community and how to collect data on the most effective ways to do that. So I, I think you're right, Maurizio, that we're really far from knowing what's the effective planning as we move out of hospital back into the community and how to actually support that effectively. Thank you. We have a big research centre based within the department looking at exactly those integrated problems of health and social care, but um, it's one of the very few and globally, it's certainly one of the few in Europe. Yeah, and we, with our president uh, elect Elia Zule, we actually started to work more and more also on patients and families as a team, and we definitely want to involve them and to get their outcomes as well. Uh, Ritesh, maybe one last comment from your side. No, you're on mute. I thought, you thought your hand was up. Uh, okay, I think we are coming to the end of the hour, I think. Um, maybe I'll say something and then Alistair, if you want, you can you can conclude. I have to say it's been fantastic and also great to see when you bring different figures talking about the same problem together into a virtual room this time, but next time uh, we'll be in a physical room. The different perspective and really the transdisciplinarity of the works that we do, I think, I, I, I'm very optimistic that this is the beginning of a series of collaborations on education and research. And I would like to thank 
uh, all the speakers and the LSC and everyone connected today and remind everyone about the post-product course in Paris in October before our annual conference. Alistair, for you, to you for the closure. Well, just to say thanks very much for your participation to the audience and to everybody here on the panel. Um, we're really excited to move this collaboration forward. As Lenny said, I think we have to look towards cooperation to make this world move forward. And if we don't cooperate in doing so, it'll be a worse world in doing it as a result. So um, I really look forward to seeing you all in Paris and um, hope that you enjoyed this uh, brief introduction to the department and to our, uh, our collaborator collaboration as it starts. Thank you very much.